Good morning, everybody. Today is Halloween. Happy Halloween. And our Halloween lecture is somewhat apropos. We are going to be talking about the art of the ancient Near East today, which this year that I'm recording this is 2016. So we're going to be going back to actually 9,000 years before the Common Era, which means nine and two is 11. We're going back like 11,016 years ago in this cauldron of the ancient Near East, this region that has been a region of war and cultures uprising and destroying one another for untold millennia. So we're just gonna take a little tiny peek inside the ancient Near East today. So you could think of Iraq, modern day Iran, modern day Saudi Arabia, Syria, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Turkey. That's where we're gonna be looking, but most of the names are different. So here's a map because I love maps. And so if you look very carefully on this map, you can find Uruk, Ur, Akkad, Lagash, and Babylon. And some of those names might sound familiar. Most people have heard of Babylon. And so you're, we're actually gonna look at the Babylonian culture. You can see here where it says Persia. Persia now is called Iran. And you can see Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Desert, which is pretty much mostly tribal at this, for most of the time, all the way for like a long time, it's tribal. There's Arabian tribes are probably the oldest lasting tribal culture. They last all the way up until 600 CE when Muhammad comes on the scene, which is way past what we're gonna look at in this section. So. In chapter one, we looked at hunters and gatherers, if you remember, and we imagined being in a civilization that was just like 15 or 20 people and everybody sort of has one job and their entire life is constructed of gathering food, cooking and eating it, and getting up the next day and doing it again. They're nomadic, so basically they use all the food uh, that they can find in one area and they travel to where food will be plentiful and also to a climate that'll be more friendly to them. So a lot of things happen between, now, so we were back in what, 30,000 years ago. So fast forward about 20,000 years. And so as people's populations develop, we end up getting cities. And when you have more and more people interacting with each other, they start making laws, they start making rules, they start trying to figure out how to live with one another. So art history is very much a story of human history as well, that a lot of the art that we see recorded talks about the way people learned how to interact with each other and how to work together and how to keep from killing one another, although they weren't always so sex successful in the ancient Near East. Anyway, in this chapter, we're gonna look at civilization construction. And we actually know a lot about this because we have the invention of writing. So we're gonna look at five civilizations, Sumerians, Babylonians, Assyrians, Neo-Babylonians or New Babylonians and Persians. So you can see that there is a span from 3,600 BCE, almost 4,000 BCE, which if you remember, that's before Common Era. And the Common Era is right around the time that Christ was born. And we go up to the Persians in 559 to 331, and they're actually contemporaneous with the Greeks. So another thing that's gonna start happening now is that in this lecture and the following one, we're looking at ancient Near Eastern civilization and the way the humans in this particular geographical area, which is quite large, are constructing their civilizations. Then we're gonna take a trip back in time again and look at ancient Egypt. It's a similar timeline. And from the Neolithic period before Egypt all the way up to the Persian era again. And after we've done that, 
Then we'll look at Aegean art. Again, we go back 3,000 years in the Cyclades. And once we've gotten through all of those, so it's kind of like one of those dreams where you, you go back and then you're just stepping forward and you get to just one point and then, oh, you got to roll all the way back again. So we're going to do that for the next three chapters. And then, what, then it all comes together like strands in a cloth. And the ancient Greeks become sort of a stepping stone for the study of all of the rest of Western art in the rest of this semester and survey two. So the Greeks are a connection, will be a connection point, and they start right around the same time that we see the Persian civilization. So just after 3000, Sumer gets divided into city-states. So what's a city-state? A city-state is a city that is surrounded by walls. It's autonomous. That is to say, it has its own lands, it has its own king, and each city-state is separate from another. So it's not like an empire where they all get together and rule. They are in conflict with one another and each one striving to be dominant. So when you look at Uruk, Akkad, and Ur, you look at the dates, all three of those existed together for all that time, but at different times, one was dominant over another. So they're walled cities and each has their own standing army, each has their own source of income, and each at one time or another has a stronger or weaker ruler. So all three of these are Sumerian, and the Sumerians have what's called a pantheon of gods and goddesses. So a pantheon is, instead of having just one god that does everything, they have lots of different gods and goddesses, which in their case, they are personifications of the natural forces of nature. And you're gonna find that the ancient Near Easterns, the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, all have a pantheon. We can't really speak to the Minoans and the Mycenaeans and the Cyclades in the Aegean art because we have no written history from them. But the cultures that we have written history from, we have a whole group of gods, and we know all their names and we know what they did. So we know which one is the god of the moon, which is the goddess of the sun, the god of the moon. And each one thinks a different thing about their gods. So. The Sumerian gods act just like humans, but they have supernatural powers. And the Sumerians think they all live together on a mountain. So each one of those city-states had its own patron deity, but they all had a common set of gods that all lived on the same mountains. And the Sumerians didn't think that they would go and live with the gods in the afterlife. They actually just thought that they just went underground and just lived there. And so this is a list of the gods and goddesses, and I don't need to read these all out to you, if you look at the ones in bold, those are the ones we're going to look at that are actually illustrated in different works of art. For some of them, there's two names here. So this is an interesting subject, and you can go online and you can find all kinds of things and images about these. Remember, this is a survey class, so because it's a survey class, we can only look at a little tiny bit about each subject and there's just oceans of information about every little tiny thing I talk about. So I mentioned to you that there is writing and the kind of writing that the Sumerians and the Assyrians and the ancient Near Eastern people used, it was called cuneiform. And so if you notice this slide, it's showing you pictographs and then early cuneiform signs and then later. So think about the cave art that we saw. Remember the bird man in Lascaux Cave? He was kind of a pictograph. We don't really know what that image was all about. It could have been, you know, a, some sort of a symbolic language that we have no way to trace. So. We do know that around 3100, there were recognizable things. So for instance, a bull's head or a bowl, or down at the bottom, you see a head in a bowl. We know that means eating. And then it gets sort of in early cuneiform, they get abstracted. And then in later cuneiform around 700, it actually devolves into a written language. So they start using, they start using what's called a stylus and they do this on wax tablets or they etch it out onto rock. So they, there's different words composed by just making these marks so that are very easy to make with a stylus. So like many 
many art forms. The form of these letters has a great deal to do with the kinds of tools they were using to create them. The first thing we're going to look at is sculpture. And so in Sumerian culture, they actually do different things with their relief sculpture, which if you remember from our little introduction, relief sculpture is sculpture that's carved out onto a wall, and then stone sculpture in the round, which is like a round object that you make. Like here's my coffee thermos. It is in the round. You can see all the way around it. You can pick it up. That's a sculpture in the round. So they do all kinds of sculptures with relief. And it's usually, it could be in public buildings. It could be in town squares. It could have historical events. It could be religious subjects or just myths maybe, or just somebody having supper. So all different kinds of things in relief sculpture. But the Sumerians reserved sculpture in the round, making actual figures just for use in their temples. So they represented the deity or the deity's worshiper or the worship of that deity as an abstract concept. So unlike the woman from Villendorf that we looked at previously in the Paleolithic times, these figures we have specific uses for, we know what they're for and where they were used. And they're also, the thing about them is that they are, they all have a common form to them as you'll see in a minute. So just to sort of give you a sense of where we're at, if you look at this map of the Fertile Crescent, you can see Sumer. It's right down by the Persian Gulf. And Mesopotamia is, this is all called the Fertile Crescent because at this time it was well irrigated. There was, it was very rich, plenty of water, very easy to grow crops. So you can see that these city-states are all clustered very, very close together. And some of these names are probably familiar to you. Um, Nineveh, you've read about probably. Babylon, you've read about. Lagash, Mari. So it's interesting. And then Tigris and Euphrates rivers are the rivers for the Middle East. They're the rivers for the, for the Fertile Crescent. And so you can see Jericho, where we're going to visit just for a minute from the Neolithic culture, is way over by the Mediterranean Sea. It is not in the Fertile Crescent. And then Egypt is even farther west. You can just see the, the beginning of the Nile there. And don't forget that these cultures did have some commerce and some contact with each other. But you can see from this, they had to go all the way across the Arabian Desert. So it was quite a journey to get from the Mesopotamia to Egypt. But there were people living everywhere in the desert. There's tribes in the desert. It's very, lots and lots of people. So agriculture came out in the Fertile Crescent a long, long time before it did in Europe. It's the earliest agriculture that we have. Um, it's probably, we think, earlier than Egypt, although Egypt is a close second and we're really not sure. So, but the first farming communities we have evidence is 9,000 BCE. So that's a long time ago. That's 11,000 years ago. And so it, it was gradual. Their evolution into cities is gradual and it took irrigation. They actually constructed agriculture water supply. They began irrigating the fields. So even back then, 10,000 years ago, people figured out how to move water and grow crops. So we have a lot of contributions to human development here. They're the first ones that invented writing. Absolutely, there's no question about that. And so this the first written history that we have, the first religious text we have, also economic records, which you think, well, you know, that sounds boring, but it actually isn't because when you have an ex economic record of what people actually bought and sold and the stuff they were using and how many Many of them they bought. That tells us a lot about a culture. Just think what we would know, somebody from 5,000 years from now would know about how many cell phones are bought versus how many, I don't know, what's something that people don't buy very much of, watercolor paint, I don't know. But you, you get a sense of what is important to a culture, what they're consuming. And it helps us understand artistic products because we know more about their culture. And of course, they had the first poetry too, of course. So because we know they're writing poetry, we can see that they have art form. Also, it takes a developed culture, it takes a developed culture to 
create art because you have to have enough stability where there are resources, there are time, there is enough members of the society that can devote themselves to that. So that's a big deal. So the Neolithic era is around 5,000 years, between 9,000 and 4,500. And then the Mesopotamia starts with the Uruk period around 4,500 to 3,100. And they sort of move out of the Neolithic age and into a little bit more advanced population. But it's gradual, like everything else. If you look at human history, it says Neolithic period, Bronze Age. But of course, like everything else, there's all this in between. And a lot of it has to do with technology, too. So the main sites that we have evidence from, and so here's the thing, is the study of art history that we're doing together is based on stuff people found at various sites and wrote about. So there could be all kinds of other stuff nobody ever found from somewhere else. We don't know that. We go by what we have. So that's why I'm listing this this way as principal sites, because I like to be precise. So we know we have objects from ancient Iran, 5,000 to 331 BCE. We have objects from Achaemenid Persia. We have objects from Anatolia, which is Turkey. So I just thought you'd like to know what the modern equivalents are, so I made a slide for this. So it's kind of interesting. So the slides we're gonna look at from the Neolithic era are actually from modern, what's modern Israel now. And Mesopotamia, this whole Fertile Crescent is modern Iraq, which tells you a lot about Iraq because it's a cornerstone. It's a cornerstone, it's these, got these two rivers, it's the cradle of civilization. Uruk is still Uruk, you know, some of these are still the same. Um, Assyria is in modern Turkey and ancient Iran is modern Iran. The Achaemenid Persians are sort of near modern Shiraz. You can find Persepolis still. And the Scythians are actually up in, from the Ukraine. And I made you a map. So I superimposed the ancient names with the new names. So here's Iraq up here. Here's Mesopotamia down here. Here's Saudi Arabia is here, still Arabia. Um, not, and then, of course, some of these borders are different. Here's Israel. So we're going to look at Sidon and Tyre. Here's Jericho down here. We've got this head from Katal Hyuk up here in Turkey. Here's this little tiny, if you see in the news, all these refugees going across to Greece, here's where they're going. See how narrow that is? You know, when you look at this on a map and you really think about it, you're like, huh. So here's Iran and Afghanistan. So that was called Bactria and it was called Persia. And here's Tehran at the bottom of the Caspian Sea. So the city-states can come out because of this large-scale irrigation, as I said. And so there is some constancy. Usually, we have two protective deities. They're male figure and a female figure, and they're together, you know, in whatever their equivalent of marriage is. If you remember what I said earlier, that the Sumerians really thought of their gods like humans with superpowers, this it goes along with that. And then you start seeing complexity in their architecture, and we see sacred space and religious buildings that are a whole symbol, symbol of the cosmic world of the gods. Mud bricks, we don't have the whole city, we just archeologists find foundations, and then they extrapolate from that what the cities are like. So, but what they find, they found evidence where people were doing flour, where they're making bricks. And so we know sort of how this civilization worked, what their technology was. And then the Sumerians believed that the gods had power over human activities. So there would be a god that gave power to the bricklayers, for, ex for instance. It was very specific. So here's our first art object. Well, it was a lot of talking, right? So anyway, here's a skull from Jericho, which if you remember, this is Israel. It's probably one of the earliest, earliest Near Eastern cities of any. It's um, population 2,000 people by 7,000 BCE, so roughly 9,000 years ago, and it covers six acres, we found it. So this is a plastered skull, and they found lots of these skulls. They would save the human skull, then coat it with plaster, and then keep it. So this is a good subject for Halloween. These Jericho inhabitants from 9,000 years ago are saving the skulls of their ancestors and coating them with plaster and keeping them in order to reconstitute their spirits 
so that they can talk to them or get enlightenment from them. This is a reconstruction drawing of the city um, of Ain Ghazal in Jordan. It's bigger than Jericho. There was 30 acres of mud brick houses here. So this is sort of your early step towards city-states. This is before they made city-states, a sort of a bridge culture, if you will. It doesn't have walls. It doesn't have fortifications around it. And this is a figure that was found there, and it's made out of clay plaster. They found more than 30 of these things. So I also just wanted to take a walk up to Turkey, and this is a statue from a place called Katal Hyuk. I'm pretty sure that's how, how to pronounce it. And so the burials are a lot like the burials they found in Jericho, found in houses. So again, I, I should have mentioned a lot of times the people would bury their dead right under their house so the dead could always live with them. And so this is probably the biggest Neolithic site that we've found from 6,500. And they found many of the figures in shrines. This is actually a goddess giving birth. And then we have a relief. And if you recall what I said, this is a relief of two leopards painted plaster. So very symmetrical, much more abstract than the Paleolithic cave paintings that we saw. This is the shrine room. This is another god giving birth here. So this is the kind of place that that goddess would have been found. So that's all I have for slides from the Neolithic period, but that should give you sort of an overview or a sense for what that culture would have left for a base for the next people to come and build on. So that period ends somewhere around 4,500 to 4,000 BCE. And now again, and you're gonna hear me say this over and over, that's a period of 500 years. So for example, we're in the United States of America, which, began what, 1775, 18, 19, we aren't even 300 years old yet, our whole country. And we're not even sure, you know, somewhere in these 500 years, when we're looking at ancient times, those 500 years seem, seem pretty close together. But if you think about it in terms of actual human beings living, and then take into account the fact that people didn't live as long then as they do now, that's a lot of generations. So there's a lot that happens in these interim times that we don't really address. And I always like to say that, that one thing I would love if you could take away from this course is what I call the long view of history. Just when we see what's going around in the world around us now, take the long view, think, well, you know, you know, how are we even going to look at this for 100 years from now or 200 years from now? You know, we've been looking at civilizations that, you know, somewhere in these 500 years this happened. So anyway, Mesopotamia is what we're going to look at next. It's the center of the ancient Near Eastern civilization, and it derives from Middle River. So it's the land between the rivers. It's in Iraq, as we've said, very, very harsh climate. So they had to learn to use these two rivers that they were given in order to survive. And so the southern terrain was very wide open. So it was sort of a double-edged sword, very vulnerable to invasion, but very accessible to trade. So that's another reason to make city-states, because if you're vulnerable to invasion, you have this wonderful fertile land. So you become rich you need to be able to defend it. So the Mesopotamians also is polytheistic. They also have a pantheon. It's a little bit different than the Sumerians, a little bit more advanced. It's like anything, the Sumerians are very simple and as civilization advances, so does their spiritual concepts. So the word polytheistic means many gods. So the ancient Near Easterns, the Mesopotamians, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Romans, the Greeks are all polytheistic religions. They have many gods. And Judaism, Islam, Christianity, those are monotheistic religions. They have one god. And you're going to find that the study of Western art is very much a study of religious art as well. It seems that humans create art around their spiritual life. So our knowledge of these gods comes from artwork, from texts, from prayers that they wrote out or rituals they wrote how to do their worship rituals. 
Oftentimes, interestingly enough, if you read there's stories that are similar to the Old Testament, they have the story of a flood, but they believed that the universe was created by a primal sea. So they believe that everything came out of an ocean soup, if you will, and that the dead live below the earth. So they also believe that. So these are cone mosaics and cone mosaics decorate many, many different temples. And that's, I'm showing you sort of the kind of patterning that you would see inside their temples. We don't have any full temples left, but we do know that the temples would have been dedicated to each city's patron deity. And they were oriented with the four corners to the four points of the compass, which tells us that they had navigation still skills. They knew Northeast, South and West, which is also pretty interesting, I think. Here's your names of gods and goddesses again. So the first civilization we're sort of taking another look back at is Sumer. So what is happening in Sumer between 3500 and 2340? So what's happening in Uruk, which is now Warka, Iraq? What's happening in Ur, which is right now a modern Mukayar? in Iraq and Eshnuna, which is Tel Asmar in Iraq. So what's happening in these places 5,000 years ago? So we've seen the Neolithic Sumerians already. So this is the same culture, just a little farther along. And one thing about Ur is that Ur, we found so many economic records from Ur, and they also were the first to invent coinage, which, you know, they, they had a money system and economic system. So we have a lot of information about the culture of Ur. You have vocabulary quizzes in your text. There's, as you've probably discovered, you've got study quizzes and vocabulary quizzes. Don't miss them, and they're in separate sections. So just to make it easier for you, you're going to find a long slides like this. And so I've tried to just sort of point them out to you. These are good places to go to quickly get your vocabulary and learn these words. Again, art history is a language. So if you learn these words, when I say, well, there's a ziggurat, you're going to know, you're going to have this visual image in your mind of what that thing is. You'll know the difference between a ziggurat and a pyramid and who made which one. So here's a cylinder seal impression from Uruk. So this is a Sumerian, a later Sumerian image. It's Mesopotamian. If you look on the right side of this picture, it's like a little round cylinder, like my thermos I held up. And then to the left, this is what it would look like if you could unwrap the cylinder, if you made it flat. So they would take these seals and roll it. They'd put a piece of wax. They'd roll the cylinder seal along the wax to make this wax impression. And that would be what would seal important writings or important documents. In the um, storage houses, for example, if you were a merchant and you own many, many jars of olive oil, all of your jars would be sealed with your certain seal so everybody would know that that though all those jars of olive oil belong to you now this is I've already talked to you a little bit about cuneiform writing I wanted you to see what it would look like on a tablet so this actual one is from 3500 to 3000 and so this is when they actually started using this on clay and stone tablets so there's sort of they made it on wax as i've said they would use wax and make an impression right you know into the soft wax they'd also do it on clay and let it harden if it was something really permanent they'd carve it in, into stone so this is a cuneiform tablet i wanted to, you to see you know they found many many of these tablets with all different kinds of stories on it there's a myth of gilgamesh Depending on which edition of the textbook you have, the myth of Gilgamesh is printed in there. And if you don't find it online, it's pretty interesting. It's very parallel to Noah's flood in Genesis 6 to 8. The Sumerians say that the flood separates preliterate Mesopotamia from its literate historical era. So the Neolithic Sumerians would have come before the flood, and those that have the writing would have come after it. Here is a ziggurat. So this is a reconstruction drawing of what's called the Anu Ziggurat, which would have been in Uruk around 3100. And it's possible that they built it, it tore it down, built it again. It was a proclamation of wealth and power. It's also an example of load-bearing construction. That is that it's sloped out from the outside to the inside, and actually the walls are slightly curved in order to help the load not collapse in on itself. 
I think I've got another picture of it. Here's the actual thing. So if you look at this really closely, you can see there's actually even a slight curvature. This is not hollow. This is a solid block. You can see the road leading up to it. You can see the steps. And this is not what it would have looked like to the Mesopotamians. It would have been a beautiful mountain. It would have been covered with trees. They would have had water pumped in there. There would have been waterfalls and streams and flowers and dirt. And they would use it for processions. And it was meant to replicate the mountain that the gods lived on. So Ur was the center for the worship of the moon god Nana. So that's why this is called the Nana Ziggurat. And here's your definition of this thing. It's a world mountain. This is a better diagram than my early one. So you can kind of see the platforms where the trees would be, and you can see the different routes depending on their importance or you know which ritual they were doing that the priests and priestesses would have gone. And so the slight curvature is called entasis because if it was all executed in straight lines, it would not only appear as if it was heavy and sagging, but it would also sort of collapse in on itself. So it's mostly solid. So they really didn't have a lot of trees to build post and linnel. They didn't have natural stones, unlike the Egyptians. So they had a lot of mud. So they made everything out of mud brick. Remember we saw these mud brick houses, the city states are mud brick walls. That's pretty much their architectural material. So they made bricks out of dirt and straw and water and then they left it in the sun to dry. And they figured out that bitumen will actually act like asphalt. They could use it for waterproofing. And over the years, they got pretty sophisticated with the way they made bricks. They fired them in a kiln. They figured out how to make glazes. You'll see later in Neo-Babylon and the Gate of Ishtar. So they got very sophisticated with their use of bricks. Now we will look at the sculpture in the round. These are the Sumerian votive figures. So remember those cone mosaics we looked at a minute ago? That would have been the decoration for the temple you'd find figures like this in. Now this is a whole grouping of them. Some temples might have had this many in a group. These are a picture from your textbook and they're in some museum somewhere. So who knows if this is the grouping that would have actually existed in ancient times. But the thing about these is they're votive, which means they're dedicated to the worship of a god or goddess. And people would commission this to be made or if they could afford it. And depending on what they could afford, it would be better or worse materials. So for example, here is a woman from Uruk and she's made out of marble. And the thing about this is that marble was not indigenous to Uruk. So that means it had to be imported, which means that this is probably somebody important. It would have been attached to a wooden head on a life-size wooden body. So they would have had to import the wood. This would have been a very important sculpture. So really, the materials used determine its significance. And this is actually just known as the Warka head. And we've talked about this. If we don't know anything about what a sculpture was used for, we don't know if it was a ritual mask. We don't know if it was a ritual figure. Usually figures are votive figures, so it's most likely it was that. But we really don't know. It's most likely that it's depicting the goddess Inanna. But again, that's we're figuring that out by the materials and the size of it. This is a carved vase. It's known as the Uruk vase. And it was discovered in the shrine of the goddess Inanna. This is the Uruk vase. And it was made out of alabaster, which is a gypsum. And it's a white mineral. So it comes in one piece out of the earth. It's a rock, but it's very, very soft. So this was completely carved out of one solid rock. And it would have been used for some type of ceremony. They found it in the shrine of the goddess Inanna. And the art on it is in the form of registers, which is a very common way that we find ancient art done. They're bands that sort of divide up the space. And if you notice, the figures are all against a very plain background. So that'll focus our attention on these figures. And the relief is called low relief. So those leopards that you saw a minute ago, they were sticking out a little farther. That's called high relief. Some is low relief, some it's high relief. And it really depends on the object and the material again.
the bottom is goats, palm leaves, barley ears. This is all the stuff that they're going to offer to the goddess Inanna. At the very top, we see the goddess Inanna. She's in her role. She's a fertility goddess in this role. She had several different roles. The top register is the most important, of course, so she would be bigger. This is called hieratic scale, which, again, you're going to see this a lot through the next few weeks. So in the middle, we have the male offering bearers. So Inanna is the most important. She's at the top. She has her beautiful nude offering bearers bringing her her goats and her barley, her different offerings. So most historians think this is a ritual marriage on this vase, perhaps in a New Year's festival. That's the common interpretation for this. And just to give you a sense of time, this is much, much older than Herodotus. But I put in here that Herodotus actually wrote a description of a ziggurat that he saw at Babylon, and he described a ceremonial marriage. So we have historical records of these kinds of worship ceremonies, so we're extrapolating the fact that that's what this vase is depicting. So these votive figures that we're looking at, just to go back to them, and I, I kind of wanted to look at them, bring you around to some of these other objects in context that would have existed with them, and then bring you back around them. So you need to understand the way they're functioning and, again, the materials used. So think about that head from Warka. It was made of marble. It would have been made by somebody that could afford marble. They put them in the temple sanctuary, so there would have been a cult statue of the deity. So that is why most interpreters think that that Warka head was probably a figure of Inanna. It might have been a wooden sculpture with that mask on it, and then Voda statues like this would have been grouped around it, and it all would have been decorated with mosaics, like those comb mosaics. So just to sort of put that all together for you. And so you notice that they all have this, so I'll do it. So they're doing this. They are keeping their eyes wide. You can't really see it with my glasses. I'll do it again. I'll take my glasses off. Right. Wide staring eyes. Worshipful look beyond humanity. So they represent the worshiper as they wish the God to see them. They wish the God to see them as their entire life devoted. That's why it's called a votive figures to the worship of the God. They're idealized. That's why they all look the same. They're not true portraits. These don't really look like the people that donated them. They are an idealized view of the way the people would like the God to see them. So it's a contemplation. There's no emotion. So because we found some of them in temples and some in workshops, we know that there are strict rules for representation on these. They're reduced to simple geometric shapes, cones, cylinders, circles. And if you notice, if you made a cone around the head, you could see it's the apex of the cone from the feet to the head. Of course, the eyes would have been precious stones, and it's, of course, been looted. Here's some details to give you a sense. Here's the wide staring eyes, stylization, frontal poses. These are common elements that you can recognize in a votive statue of a Sumerian. So the work ahead, this Sumerian votive statues, these are both examples of stylization, of reducing an image to just simple elements to give an idea of a human rather than a specific portrait with little nuances of exact features. Just to give you an idea of the ceramics, here's an image of a scarlet ware pottery. This particular group of ceramics we have dated to 3000 to 2350. Again, we have groups of objects from specific places, so they're just sort of a flyer into what the imagery would have been like. And it's interesting to notice this. If you look at the geometric figures on the bottom, when we start looking at Greek vases, you're gonna see some parallels in the way the figures are depicted. 
We have some incredible objects from Ur. This is a bull lyre from the tomb of King Abargi in 2685. And it's wood with inlaid gold, lapis lazuli shell, 13 inches high. It's an incredible object, beautifully made. And if you look at this bull's head, think back to Katal Hyuk that we saw in 6000 BCE. So this motif of the bull's head has already been around for 3000 years. And we're going to see it again in Persepolis. We're also going to see it in the Minoan culture. So the bull is clearly very important in all of these Middle Eastern cultures. This is the decoration on the front of this bull lyre. So there's a man holding on to two human headed bulls here, which, and this is very interesting because in Crete, we have the story of the Minotaur, who is often depicted or seen as a human-headed bull or, you know, the product of a union between a woman and a bull. So it's interesting that this, from a completely separate culture, highly unlikely that the two would have connected, that we still have this image. Underneath him, we have these animal attendants is bringing food and drink for a feast and then animal musicians playing. And in the bottom, here's this scorpion man. Maybe he's a guardian of the sun. He's holding clappers, attended by a gazelle. All of the stories that you can imagine from these figures. And note the detailing, the beard is solid lapis lazuli, which is a precious stone. 